Uh, greetings to everyone today. Thank you for coming out and celebrating the Lord with us. Um, I have um, been on a mission uh, for the last week, and uh, I was called um, to uh, to the side of uh, a pastor um, who uh, has um, now become a widow, and um, there were there were people that had been in our lives for numbers of years and uh, God allowed us to uh, just one call uh, I preached a message here years ago and it was it was entitled it all started with a call and in the beginning when God called to Adam uh, he said Adam where are you it started with a call everything starts with a call I don't know about you but I can go back and see relationships in my life uh, that started with just a call. Somebody called you. Maybe you're visiting the church or you've come to the church. Somebody called and said, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And it's amazing. That one visit turned into a lifelong relationship. And I called this gentleman. We had, used, we had traveled for years. And uh, my family, my girls were young. Uh, they, uh, they, we had a time where we took about uh, five or six years and uh, began to travel and minister amongst um, our First Nations people. Uh, many of you know them as Native Americans or Indians would be the lowest on the totem pole to call them. Um, but we call them First Nations people. Uh, they were the people that were here before any of us got here. All right. And um, the, uh, the, the Spirit of the Lord caused our lives to be connected integrally with these wonderful people of the land and uh, on several occasions we would have meetings where we would invite others I was very careful over the years and I still am as to who I bring to minister to First Nations people because unless you know who you're ministering to you could actually do more damage than good and uh, I saw preachers trying to hang on my coattail and get invited and uh, I, I made a few enemies because I didn't let them come uh, because I knew, I just know. How many of you understand the Bible gives you, uh, the word of the Lord is, the Bible says it will even actually show you the intent of the heart. And so we, we understood that God had given us a, a doorway, an open door. Like Paul said, there was an open door being given. And so we, opened, we, we went through that open door and I took this particular person uh, over 20 years ago to the Navajo Indian Reservation. Um, in the beautiful, beautiful area there in the corner of New Mexico and Arizona known as Window Rock. And uh, the rest is history. And uh, this man served there faithfully. God blessed him. He left actually, turned his work over in, in Atlantic City and they moved out there, took staff. And to this day, they, they minister to all over the, the Navajo Indian Reservation. And for 20 plus years, they've been there, secured land, and God has blessed them. And he went on to be with the Lord, which broke my heart in a sense, because I, I wasn't able to touch him like I wanted to over the last uh, 20 years or so. But how many of you know when you have relationships those relationships last. We've said this, and this become kind of a motto, relationship is more important than opportunity. Uh, sometimes folks will see things as opportunities. And if I talk about this too long, you'll even feel like, wow, we need to do something. We need, and we do need to do something, but we need more than anything is to connect across, uh, across lines and connect with the spirit of people, not just with their history. But the history of the Native American is deep. And uh, with especially the Navajo tribe. The Navajo is the largest tribe landmass in, uh, in the United States. Over 27,000 square miles uh, uh, is still Navajo Indian Reservation. And so as we go into these places over the years, we find ourselves connecting with people that we have a lasting impact with. And so as we went out this last weekend and prophesied and ministered, uh, was able to minister in a, in a church uh, in Gallup, New Mexico, and then on into the reservation, and we just got a short slide for you. I want you to see the faces. I want you to see the places and what God has done and what God continues to do. Now, you're really involved 
you don't realize it, but you're really involved in now ministry to First Nations people. Thank you, Kyle, for providing this. Down here to share his vision uh, eight years ago. Wow. But eight, eight, nine, so nine, this is an old burnout. It was a burnout school. Old burned out grammar school grammar that school. was abandoned. Wow. The Navajo nation decided to move their children elsewhere because there was a lack of children coming here. Wow. And it was vacant and vandalized and it was just uh, Pete's heart has all about restoration. Yeah. He's just taking it, man, under his wing and amazing what's happening here, though. I, I watched him through it all. Uh, just go through peaks and valleys here and wow. watched him persevere, never giving up, never Amazing. giving up. Amazing. It just keeps going. This is the work area. Okay. And do they have, do they train guys on? You can see prefab walls built here. Right. And they have... They had jigs here wow. where they would build hogans okay. um, and restore elderly people's homes and families in need here on the reservation. There's just so many different aspects of need here on the reservation, and uh, Cornerstone Ministries is all about that. Wow. That's what this place is about. Amazing. Sharona ordained to him. This was the old burnout school, and they have restored it, and now they're giving to all of the Navajo Reservation, supplying. And God is just giving them truckloads to supply. All the way to Walt Disney. Walt Disney's brought truckloads of, of toys, etc. That's the pastor's wife that passed. babies that was the original time that I brought pastor there where you could see him playing the guitar 20 plus years ago
staff members. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes. Navajo, a Navajo hymn. Give the Lord praise today. Amen. All right, children, you're dismissed today. Let's thank God for all of our lively stones and Pastor Nick. And we celebrated Pastor Nick's birthday last week. Was that special? Thank you, Jungle Jen, for doing that for Pastor Nick. Amen. All of the kids. I want to get right into the message today. I'm grateful to the Lord for you all today. After 40 years of walking uh, people through uh, trauma, through different seasons of uh, affliction, there, there comes a time when uh, you actually look back and uh, take stock of some things. Um, how many of you have had to walk through some bitter places in your world so far? Anybody besides me? Um, I borrowed a little term today uh, that's been used a lot. And I uh, borrowed this term, and we'll, make, uh, we'll certainly take a light subject and go a little deeper with it today, but... How many of you have been given a few lemons in your life? When I was in the Navy, a young man, I was stationed in San Diego, and I'll never forget, just never forget it, and there was a particular automobile that uh, some guy had bought, and he was so uh, upset uh, that it was a lemon. Anybody ever had a lemon before? And I'll never forget it. I really will never forget it. It still just sticks out in my mind. And uh, he literally leased a piece of ground. He leased a piece of ground downtown San Diego. And I mean a square like, you know, uh, I don't know. And who knows? He was probably wealthy. But he leased a square and he built a tower. He built a tower that was high, like 100 feet or higher, and he put this car on top of this tower, and he painted it yellow, and he advertised for a year or so. He leased the land, and he advertised, this car is a lemon. I'll never forget it, because every time you went downtown San Diego, there it was, 
and uh, and I, I would I've had no idea of way of tracking this, but I would say that particular uh, year of that model of that kind of car probably didn't do too well in San Diego. And after after so many years of being with people, you know, walking with people, um, you find out that there are a, even though you go through different things, okay, you go through different things you still have the same God, okay? God is still God, no matter what you're going through. And I find that there's a place where uh, the longer you serve God, the more you recognize and realize that he does have a solution for the pollution that comes. Uh, That he does have a, a way uh, even in the wilderness. He is a way maker. That's who we know him as, right? And so, you know, this last weekend was particularly important for me because God let me walk through another situation and scenario that was a very deep-seated, uh, a lot of emotions and a lot of connections, right? And I didn't realize that just one call 20 plus years ago, that someone could make that big of an impact. And, but when I saw the people that came and I saw the, and they continued to come and you saw the little video, and we'll talk more about that later, uh, about what God is doing there. But I saw how even through the years of, and there was pain involved. There were some real days of, are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? And it was interesting because they picked that track there, the little Navajo choir that was out on the res, that was at the property known as Summit Training Post. And you'll know more about that as the days come. And, uh, but I, I listened to those little women, those little Navajo women sing, I know that I can make it. Somebody say, I know that I can make it. Now, now, how do you know you can make it? You, you've never been there. What would you say something so outright, bland, and, and just, just forthright? I know that I can make it. And then there are all kinds of voices saying, what if you don't? What if it breaks? What if they leave? What if he leaves? What if death visits your door? What if, what if, what if money dries up? What if, what if? If I lived my life by what if, I wouldn't have a what for. If I live my life on a what if principle, I wouldn't have a what for to live for. I know that I can make it. I just got to figure out who I am. I got to figure out who I am because if I can make it, then my mind is telling me something different. So I've got to trust beyond what I think about something. I'm going to be a preacher in a minute, but i got to get myself beyond what I think about it. And we're in a culture now. We live in a world that just says what it thinks. And we have all kinds of avenues, social media, that we can just say what we think. And you don't realize that, that, that what happens is when you write something down and you publish it, it becomes real. And you got to understand if it's written, it becomes real. Don't write everything you think. Write what you know. I know that I can make it. Somebody would say, I think not. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that I don't write what I think and think what I write. Sometimes I need to get myself back to making God visible in my words. Because he, he said, the just shall live by what they think. Somebody say, the just shall live by faith. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 1, by entering through faith. This is in the message today. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do. Somebody say, God always wanted to do something. But it's going to take faith to enter that. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown his door open to us. Do we have it on the back screen, son? He's already. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand. Out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory. Standing tall and shouting our praise. We're out in the tall. Somebody say we're walking in the tall stuff now. Mm-hmm. Right out in wide open spaces. Man, when I got out there, it'd been a while since I've been out to, to, into New Mexico. Anybody traveled to New Mexico, right? And you know that it's just wide open spaces. And everything is just there. You can just see it. And it's there. And it seems like it's just right over there. And then 30 minutes later, it's still just right over there. You just keep going and going. How long is it? And sometimes when God puts us in wide open spaces, our vision begins to get larger and we begin to think differently. And that's why God doesn't want you in little cramped spaces in your mind. And he doesn't want you thinking small. He doesn't want you into this place where you just can only see you and two more, you know, but he wants you to agree with somebody, but he wants you to get out of that tightness of, of believing in short sightedness. And God wants you to put those long sights back on. Somebody say, I got to see past this. Man, if you get stuck in what is, you never will get to what will be. I'm going to preach a little bit today, if that's all right. And so, so we throw open doors. Somebody say, we're throwing open the doors. And in verse 3, there's more to come. Somebody shout, there's more to come. Man, if I could just preach like a wild man, I would preach right there today. There's more to come. But when you, when you stand over the casket of a loved one, come on, somebody. When you walk, when you walk through death with somebody and you walk through the, the, the throes of grief and you're, you're feeling it, it's down inside of you, somebody needs to come along and say, but there's more to come. More to come. Stay tuned, baby. Don't build your life on a commercial. There's more to come. Somebody say, there's more to come. Somebody say, stay tuned. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with trouble. Somebody say, we continue. You know, I like to hang around people who understand the word continue. We, we, we continue. I don't hang around those. I don't have a good relationship with goat people. You know what goat people say? Yeah, but. They're but everything. Yeah, but. Somebody say, get the but out of here. There's more to come. Somebody say there's more to come. We continue to shout our praise, even when we're hemmed in with troubles, because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us. Trouble don't last. <laughs> and, and, and how that patience in turn, and how that patience in turn forge 
forges Somebody say, how patience forges. Man, it, it, there's a forging going on. What, what is a forging? Forging is when you heat something up and it begins to come together with something that normally wouldn't be joined with. But when you heat the two together, you bec- they become stronger because they come together. Oh, there's a piece of you that needs a little more heating because you're resisting others. And I want to tell you something. Read reason why God wants you to go through the fire is because he's trying to temper you. He's trying to get you to a place where you don't have this higher idea of yourself than you ought to. And God wants you to take a, take a minute and just let him heat it up for a minute. Have you noticed that some of the heated conversations that you have with people can end up with some lasting long relationships? I learned this from my dear friend who passed away, Richard Twist. And Richard would have some knockdown drag outs. And watch this. He scheduled those. Richard would schedule meetings with guys that disliked him. He would say, can we go to coffee every Friday? And he knew they were going to fight him, cuss him out. And they would end up being the closest brothers. And they actually tempered so much that one of his arch enemies became one of his best friends and took him took him to Washington, D.C., set up a meeting with Congress. And he was there to speak on behalf of the First Nations people. He, he was there at the time when he was, he called me and said, bro, he always called me bro. He said, bro, guess where I'm at? I said, where are you at? He says, I'm, I'm where it all started. I'm standing in front of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He says, and you remember? I said, yeah, I remember. He said, I was here back when we took over and we stormed it and we took over. We thought was taking over the world. And the bunch of Indians came up in the 60s and they were on top throwing typewriters off and Molotov cocktails. We are going to rule the world. And kind of like SpongeBob, I think the government said, well, good luck with that. Because the fact is, is they were arrested and, and all of that, and they were high on peyote and everything, you know. And then he says, God saved me, and now I'm back, and I'm standing in front of this place, and tomorrow I'm going to speak to Congress. Yes. And that night, he entered into the last few hours of his life, and he was taken out before he could speak. How can you make it past something that takes the voice away? Can I tell you that God is the original ventriloquist? He knows how to throw his voice. And generation to generation, God throws his voice and he's still speaking. Somebody say he's still speaking. For those of you in Navajo that are watching this morning, that word, this word is not only for here, but it's for you as well. It's for all of us today. God wants us to be tempered, steel with virtue, helping us alert for whatever God will do next. An alert expectancy such as this. We've never left feeling shortchanged. I love this. Somebody say, I've never left God. Never left his presence. Never never left a situation that he's allowed in. Shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We, We can't round up enough containers. Somebody, there's not enough containers. We can't round up enough containers. Come on. Give me the next one. To hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, good job, Josh. Man, y'all need to know we got, we, got, we got help. Help is on the way. We've never left shortchanged. 
We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our life through the Holy Spirit. Christ arrives. This is what I want to tell you. Christ arrives right on time. Say it with me. Say, there's not enough. Lemonade pitchers. <laughs> There's not even enough lemonade pitchers for you to get what God wants you to get out of that sour, bitter experience that left a bad taste in your mouth. Do you know that people generally stay away from a bitter place? Once they go through a bitter season of their life, they stay away. And God says, I need you to understand that I'm the master of taking bitter things and making them sweet. I will take a bitter moment and I'll make it sweet. Somebody say, oh, sweet Jesus. Christ arrives right on time. Somebody say, lemonade gets here right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. Ooh, I love it. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get it ourselves ready anyway. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we couldn't have known what to do Anyway, somebody say he walked in and squeezed our situation. Oh, thank you. I, and somebody's got a freshly squeezed situation right here this morning. It's got pulp in it, too. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 16, verse 33. Let me just run these scriptures. Y'all ready? These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. You might have peace. You might have peace. Somebody say, he spoke to me. Peace is the result. So I got peace in, in him. Now watch what he said. These things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have trouble. In me peace, in the world trouble. In me peace, in the world trouble. In me peace, in the world trouble. Peace in trouble. Somebody say peace in trouble. But peace, but peace in me is not in trouble. Peace operates outside of trouble even though it may be, it looks like it's in trouble. God, I don't know if you see this. Peace is, peace is what, peace is what you have in the midst of trouble. Peace is what you have in the midst of the storm. Peace is what walks you through something when something is walking through you. You have peace. Peace that passes all understanding. It's walking and working in you right now. Right now it's working in you. There's not a place in you that peace cannot invade. Open yourself up. Quit closing yourself up. Quit saying those words. But. Get the but out of here. Somebody say it with me. Get the but out of here. Again. Get the but out of here. Amen. If somebody keeps butting you, just say, I don't need your butt. I don't like it. Some butts are bigger than others, too. I'm just serious. Get your big butt out of here. Amen. So, yeah. Goat head, goat, get, go, go, goat. Amen. In, he, in me, peace. In the world, trib. Trib, peace. Which do you want? I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's like tithing. No-brainer. Tithing, blessing. Holding back, curse. What is the problem? Just, just get it. 
Somebody, somebody say, get it? Got it? Good. Amen. That's right. So look at Isaiah 40. We're running it. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Now that ought to qualify what you're going to get. You're going to get something from an, an everlasting God. You're serving an everlasting God. You're not serving a, a neverlasting God. You're serving everlasting. Even if your homes get destroyed, even if the flood comes, even if the storms of life come and leaves you with, with lemons, the creator of the ends of the earth, so we're talking about the creator of the ends of the earth. We're talking about the everlasting God that he does not faint. Doesn't draw back. Oh, look. Whoa, that hit me. Neither is he weary. <laughs> and there's no searching of his understanding. Somebody say, try to figure that out. He gives power. Somebody say he gives power. So, so that's how you get this. That's how you get this place, this way of thinking, this way of living. you got to have some power other than yourself. Somebody say he gave me power. It's amazing because when you go through a storm and you lose your power, you don't recognize and realize how much is attached to flipping that switch. You just took it for granted. Somebody say, I, I'm guilty for taking the power for granted. But man, when I lose it. I would not want to be in a place right now, not in this world, with no power. I would not want to be in this world. I mean, I think we're a little bit, we're a little bit spoiled because we got power all the time. And we got power. We, we, this, hurt, this church, you know, as far as our media and everything, you got to understand. I mean, I just want to give a shout out again today. I'll just celebrate our media department and our setup team. What they do, this, the design of all this was just amazing. Whoever designed all these cameras and who put all that together, you know, I'm telling you, I, 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 should, I should get some kind of praise for that because I put it, no, 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 no. But there's, the fact is, is that the design, the design comes from the great designer. But what they do when they come in here and they plug up all this stuff, y'all just take it for granted. It just works. You don't know what's happening right now. We're running across the world. People all over the world are tuning in and saying hi. And then we break it all down. It's amazing how God gives this kind of creativity to us and puts us on this. See, that's why I thank God for, for technology and the, and the miracle of how they've discovered how electrons work over the years. It's like, wow. But what if it all stopped? Where would God be? Somebody say, same place. But the question is, where would you be? So you have to understand, God's always solid. He's solid. When, the, when your bestie leaves you, when your, when your bestie unfriends you, oh my Lord, in this day, it's just like they unfriended me. The world's going to be over. They unfriended me. And, and, and you need to know that Jesus, when, when Jesus was, was completely, I mean, when they handed him over, when he, they came and that Judas, that Judas, that Judas sold him out, that Judas with his bag of coins came up and kissed Jesus. I would have called him more words than Jesus. I would have said, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, you. But you know, Gordon, what Jesus called him? He said, friend. He said, friend. What do you have with me? Do you understand he was living on a level much higher than where we're living? 
So what we do is we want to call somebody down. We were like the sons of thunder. And it's amazing. The ones that Jesus called was those sons of thunder that wanted to call fire down on everybody. Because they had a little power. Come on, fire. And we like fire preachers. God said, God said, I didn't give you the power for that. That's not the power. That's not the power. Your power is not to be exerted upon people that don't like you. Actually, you need to call what you think your enemies, your friends, because they're pushing you on purpose. They're causing you to trust me and not yourself. Mm. They're causing you to trust me. When you can't trace me, you, you can still trust me. I, I, I'm in a place where it's hard to feel right now. I lost my, I lost my husband. I lost my, I lost, I lost, I lost. You can lose all kinds of stuff, but you don't need to lose him. He's that, he's that close. Do you know he's closer than a brother? Brothers are good, but can you get closer than a brother? He said, the Lord faints not, neither is he weary. There's no searching. He gives power to the faint and to the might. He increases strength. Now watch this. Watch this. Even the millennials. Even the Xers, even the new gens, even the, the youngest ones shall faint. This is not something that has just been scripted for a generation. It's everybody, everybody. Somebody say everybody, yeah, everybody, even everybody. I mean, the youth shall faint. Even the youth shall faint. Don't think you're escaping this because you're young and you're full of vinegar and something else my granddad used to say. But even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But, 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 watch this. This is a good but. Somebody say, this is the best but of all. But they that wait upon the Lord. Oh, I, I, I'm going to preach right now. They that wait upon the Lord shall. I, I said shall. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You run out of strength, renewal is on the way. I, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta tell you that you can go and get these little cards and you run out of money on the card. But all you got to do is just pay the fare and you can renew it and get back on the line. Somebody say, they shall mount up with wings of eagles. They'll run and not be weary and they'll walk and not faint. Now, I want to talk, talk to you just for a few minutes and I want to clarify they that wait. Somebody say, they that wait. I want you to understand this because you need to know that they that wait is not, not somebody that is just hanging around. And, and we do this, though. Lord, I just waiting on you. Just, just come and fix this, Lord. I just need you to come. I'm just waiting on you. Or I'm just, and, and I thank God for all of the messages you've heard, and I'm going to serve you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give in the offering, so I'm going to give for my miracle. I appreciate all of that, but I'm going to give you the Hebrew here. Somebody say, you need to know the Hebrew. But they that wait. But they that wait in the Hebrew, watch this. It doesn't, it doesn't mean just hanging out and, and hoping, hoping things are going to come. The, the, the Hebrew says, they that 
bind together. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. They that come together. They that come regularly and hang out together. They that become together. Together. You want to, you think coming to church is some kind of religious thing. But God says the way you're going to get through this thing is you need to have somebody that you can bind together with. There comes a time where you need to know that this, this right now is much more than setting out some chairs and getting dressed up, baby. It becomes a place where your strength comes back to you. Where you get the woo hoo spa. You, you're feeling something and you say, how did I get that from sitting on these striped chairs? And what happened to me? I came one way and left another way. I, I came and served in the media. I came and served and I came and set up some things. I, I worked with them babies over there, but something in me, something that was going to split apart, something that was being torn apart. My life was being torn apart. And I got back together again just because I came together with my brother and sister God says I got something in my mind he said I got something I'm going to trick them I'm going to call it the church and I'm going to get them to come together and if I could just get them to come together if I could ever get two or more to agree on anything I come and be in the midst I get in the midst. I get in the midst. Do you feel the agreement on that right there? Yeah. He just came. You have to understand he comes when you agree. He leaves when you dissent. When you say, I don't know. That's why he came in that upper room because they were all together in one Honda. Who stole my Honda? Amen. They were all together in one accord, y'all. They got together. See, the problem with the church is we got too, we're too smart. We got too much stuff we want to come together around. Well, what about you? Do you believe we're once, always? Do you believe it's pre, post? Do you believe in this or that? Paul said, you know what? He, Paul, Paul was like God. God was says, I need you to throw him a curve. Okay. So he said, you know what? See, some people don't like curves. He said, he threw him a curve. He said, you know what? When I come together amongst you guys, because you guys are always talking about, well, I don't know if I believe that. I don't know. He says, you know what? I'm going to just tell you, um, this, is what, this is what I believe. Um, Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, he brought it down to an act. He brought it down to an act. Everybody saw him be crucified. Everybody. Somebody say, I know that's a fact. Listen to me, Jack. If you know that's a fact, then you need to go ahead and get on board this train called the church, the local church. And you need to come in here to the stone and drop an anchor. And you need to find out that if you'll just get together and bind together some things that have been binding your, your marriage, your family, your faith, your finances, your, come on somebody, been binding your emotions, that you'll get free. I feel like a preacher and I've not even started. Somebody say, come together right now over me. Listen, don't stay away. That's the worst thing you can do. It's the worst thing you can do. When everything hits your life, the worst thing you can do. And I don't care what you think it is. It's just religious. I'm just going to go to church. Call it what you want to. God had a good thing in mind when he said ecclesia. I want you, Paul, I want you to call it a calling out. You can never get called out unless you come in. Sit down, sit down. I'm just, still, I'm just playing with you. Somebody say bind together. That is collectively. Listen, this is the Hebrew. It means collectively. Do you understand? You don't have the power you need unless you can collect it. Oh, God, I got some power. Somebody been through something in here. Somebody been through something in here I have not been through. 
And I need collectively, I need to tap in on what, how Kathy Watson is working right now. I've not been through that. She needs, I need her deposit. Come on, somebody. I need what Stephanie's gone through. Somebody say, Stephanie would even say, me? Yeah, you. I need something from you. I need what Josh has got. How, how does he walk through what he's walking through? How do these babies walk through losing their daddy? What does it feel like? I need some of your deposit. See, this, it's like making a deposit at the bank, but when you make it in your bank, it's spread out into ours. Like your deposit becomes part of mine. Chelsea, did you make some money? I got some in my account. Yeah, because, Dad, we're connected. And what I'm learning, I'm giving it back to you. I'm learning something. See, church is just not about one person coming up and doing the preaching and you sing. I know it's, sometimes it's hard because you, I, I don't get to do this. I, can I sit right here by you? Yeah. Preach! <laughs> say it, Mother. Go ahead and say it. Come on now. That's right. Say preach. Preach. All right, I'll preach. They. Somebody say they. I'm part of they. You're they. They is not determined on your background, your pedigree, where you came from, what kind of church you come out of. It's just they. Say, I am they. Ooh, I like that. I am they. When life hands you lemons, watch this. You tend to either live in the past or in the future. You tend to go back and deal and look at this. Well, I remember when we were there. Or you look in the future. I know God's got something for me. And I just, and I appreciate that. But you've got to recognize and realize he gives you strength to live in the now. You cannot dismiss the now and try to live back there or up here. Even though back there he was there and up here he's got you. But right now, it's the nasty now and now. It's the hallways. It's, there's hell in the hallways. And you've got to know how to negotiate the hallways of life. Life can hand you stuff, man. Doesn't mean you're not a believer. It doesn't mean you're anything other than walking in grace. Somebody say the grace of God is a space where God works. Lazarus. Now Jesus loved Martha. Remember Lazarus and his sister and her sister? And Lazarus, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, He called a prayer meeting. He sent out texts. He said, I got to get there. He got the next plane ride. He FedExed himself in an envelope. I don't know what he did. But no, he didn't. He actually hung out. How mean can you get? He waited. He heard that he was in trouble. But he waited. Somebody say he waited. There's a purpose in what I'm saying today. And I'll run through this. He heard he was sick. He waited two more days. And then after that, he says to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said, Master, the Jews have sought to stone you. Da, da, da. He answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? And he went through this whole scenario about them getting there. And then Jesus was speaking about his death in verse 13. And then verse 14, he said, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. This is going to blow your mind because he said two things in one breath. He said, Lazarus is dead. Somebody say he said it plainly. Lazarus is dead. Somebody say double dead, done, four days dead. You hear me? No possibility of anything coming out of that. He waited till it was impossible 
in the natural. Lazarus is dead, and then his next words blew my mind. And I'm glad. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Because I've got to get you past looking at what just happened. And get you into a place of the potential for your furtherance of your life. He says there's more to this than somebody and all of the pain they went through. He says to the intent that you may, to the intent, do you hear this? To the intent that you may get him resurrected? No, that you may believe. Belief is the cornerstone that moves you from dead places to resurrected places. Belief takes you out of the natural and moves you into the above natural. He says, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, for your sake, let's go and let's talk about Oh, let's play the funeral dirge and let's go through that. Let's do it. Because he already knew. Somebody say he already knew. Let's keep going. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus. Thomas already had a little issue going on, right? Unto his fellow disciples, let's go also. <laughs> We're going to hang out in death with him. You, let's just go on over there because you know they're going to take us out too. ISIS or whatever. Wow. Keep coming. Good job. And then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Keep coming. Let's just keep. Now Bethany was nine to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came, Martha and Mary, to comfort them concerning their brother. Keep coming. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if you had just been here. Say, Lord, if you had just been here. Do you understand the natural can really suck the supernatural out of you? Being in a place for a long time, feeling the pain of what you're walking through can really pull on that supernatural peace. Now you're walking with a supernatural God. Now you're walking, come on, in the spirit and the spirit's walking in you. So you're walking not only in the natural, you walk up the ladder in the natural, you do things in the natural, but your spirit is active and there's a spirit world taking place as your natural world takes place. And I, I like to tune into both because I, I actually want to make sure I know what my natural is doing. I'm not going to do something stupid and my supernatural just be all, I end up supernatural and no more natural. Come on, somebody. Amen. Don't, don't be so heavenly minded. You're no earthly good, right? So then said Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. Okay, watch this. Watch this. This is good. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give it to you. God will do it for you. I know, Jesus, you're the one. You're the one, Jesus. It's, always, it's you. It's you. It's you. Somebody say, it's you, Jesus. It's you. It's you. It's you. And then the next verse. I love this. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And then she went over and she said, I know. I know he'll, I know he'll come. I know, I know about the later part. But we're not talking about the later part. Somebody say, we're not, we're not talking about that. Yeah. And Jesus said unto her, what did he say? He said, I am the what? The, the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We read that at graves, right? We walk, we walk to the graveside. 
I am the resurrection and the life, right? Watch this. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Somebody say resurrection. I need you to look at first what Jesus said. He, he first, he said, I am. Somebody say, I am. He said, I am. When he said, I am, everybody in the place went, whoa. Because you have to understand, in that time, when, when he said those two words, when he made those two words and put them together, he was taking a word, he was saying, I am that I am. And they stood they step, stepped back. He said, I am that. I am a very present. I am. I am. Somebody say present. Yeah. That, is a, that is a progressive present verb in the Greek, which means I am not only am, but I'm getting more ammer. <laughs> I am and I am even more. In other words, Progressive present means I'm getting more present every moment of your life. I'm not just there. I'm more there in this moment than I was in that moment. And I'm coming even more into you. God is, God is working toward the future with you, and he's holding everything together by the word of his power. He said, I am what? Somebody say the resurrection. Do you know what the resurrection means? The word the resurrection means a standing up <laughs> and the recovery. He said, I am the stand up and the recovery. I am the stand up and the recovery. I am the stand up and the recovery. I am the one that's going to stand up and I am the recovery for you. No matter what you've been through, no matter what lemon you have been thrown in your life, he said, I need you to live in this present moment with me because I am, not you, I am the stand up. I need to stand you back up. I need to stand you back up, and I need to be the recovery. You felt, you felt like you've fallen to the... Who feels like they've been knocked down? Anybody ever feel like they've been knocked down? Come on, I've just been knocked down. I got the wind knocked out of me. You don't need to get up. See, that's your problem. You're trying to get up. You just need to let the stand up stand up you need to let him stand up and recover I know it looks bad it looks bad it looks worse it looks worse than it did yesterday the thing's getting louder bishop the car's getting a knock is getting worse somebody say hold it hold it hold it I got to let him stand up now watch this his stand up and recovery may not give you a brand new motor supernaturally, but his stand-up can be something naturally super. And somebody can walk into your life and say, I don't know why, but I feel like God wants you to have this car. Somebody say stand-up. He is the stand-up. He is the recovery. He said he is the life that satisfies. Somebody say he's the life that satisfies. And then further down, you'll see him talk in this term. In verse 33, Jesus therefore saw her weeping. And he was just like going, I am not believing this. After everything I told her, he saw her weeping, the Jews weeping, came with her. He groaned in the spirit. Somebody say he groaned in the spirit. Can I tell you what groaned in the spirit means? He groaned in the spirit. The word groaned means to snort with anger. To have indignation on. We live in this, this and I, I, I loved having Prophet here because Prophet helped you. How many of you appreciated Prophet Butler? He helped you. And some, some of the leaders on Saturday really helped you. He said, because the Prophet is not the one. That just, what did he say? 
parts your hair and oils you down. Yeah, and just strokes you. It's okay. You're going to be all right. You need... See, see, we live in this society that now you can't even say, you can't even call somebody a man or a woman hardly. It's like I got my feelings hurt. Do you understand that Jesus groaned in his spirit because he was telling her, he was telling them, and he, was, he snorted. You need to sometimes get mad about it. I don't think you heard me. You need to look at that lemon and say, I'm going to bust you up. I'm going to cut you in half. I'm going to squeeze the bitterness out of you. I'm going to get mad about it. Are you hearing this, son? That, that man lost two sons in the space of a year. Sometimes you've got to just get righteously indignant and not just stroke that thing. Well, somebody say, get mad about it. You got to get mad about it, and then you got to do one last thing. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had invaded the south, Ziklag smitten, Ziklag burned it with fire, and taken women captive. Therein they slew not any therein, great or small. They carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Somebody say, that's a bad day. Watch this, verse 4, if you can get that one up. 1 Samuel 34, then David and the people, man, you're doing good. Then David and the people that were with him, watch this, lifted up their voice and wept. Did you know back in that scripture, and I'm for the sake of time, but you know that's the scripture where it says Jesus wept? He wept when he saw them going toward that place of not fighting. He wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, right? Then David that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. Watch this. Have you ever gone through something so bad that you cried so much that you didn't even have no more cry left in you? They wept until they had no more power to weep. Do you understand? Your leaders can go through this. That's why I'm trying to tell you, your leaders can weep. We've gone through stuff, baby. We've gone through stuff. And the people I just visited, they've gone through things. They're going through things right now. Weeping. But you come to a place where you're out. You run out. You run out of emotion. You run out of everything. And watch this next verse. David's two wives were taken. Jezreelites, the uh, uh, Jezreelites, the Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, Carmelite, and David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David changed the atmosphere. David had to. You got to have some leaders that know how to change the atmosphere. We need leaders in America that can change the atmosphere and not make it worse. I'm just going to tell you, we need to be able to shift atmospheres. And we need some biblical leaders. I'm talking about biblical leaders. I wasn't talking about presidents. I'm talking about men and women of God. They're the ones that should be leading this nation. The church. Shift the atmosphere. And David encouraged himself. He encouraged himself. He grabbed a hold of himself. Close your Bible. Somebody say, I'm getting ready to grab myself. I don't know what you've been through, but I know you've been through some things. And I know you're processing places in your own world right now, but I'm telling you this morning, 
It's time to take courage. It's time to know that he's a very present help in trouble. And he said he'd never leave us. Never, 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 never leave us. He's right here, right now. And he says, I need to be your stand-up and your recovery. Somebody say, stand up, Jesus. Would the real Jesus stand up in the church? Everybody stand on your feet. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Papa God, we thank you today for the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that we have, we have learned and we're learning even more. Like the old hymn said, we're learning to lead. We're, we're learning to trust. We're learning that your sovereignty has already seen where we're at and where we're going. You promised you'd never leave us. So, Lord, right now, we take a moment and we just rest in that promise. And as we rest in that promise, Lord, we lift up our voices and we speak a word into the atmosphere that we believe you for exactly everything that you promised us and that we will not forsake being present. Yeah, we will be present right here today. Because you're a very present help in trouble. I don't know who you are today and what you've been going through, but I'm telling you right now, this message was for you. Don't let the bitter taste, don't let the bitterness of a moment linger. I need you to step into the place where he resides. It's called faith. It's called grace. It is called mercy. It's a place that you can walk into. And I'm telling you, he's sweetening the pot right now. He's calling those things which be not as though they were. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that a shift has taken place even on this earth. And we thank you, Lord, on this Yom Kippur season. We thank you, Lord God, on the trends, on the, on the moving of the moving of years and the dates being shifted and things being aligned and realigned. That God, you're opening up miracle working moments. Miracle working moments to your people. And we thank you today, God, that Lord, we're in a sphere, we're in a space now. God, where heaven is open. God, you showed me up there on the Indian reservation that, Lord, you moved from a window to a door. And you said there's a door open. And I thank you, Father God, that now, God, not a, a, not a window now, but a doorway has opened. A major doorway has opened. And, God, we sense your grace this morning. We sense your power. We sense your glory. In the name of Jesus. And we receive it now. Come on, if you receive it, give the Lord a praise. Receive everything he came to give you today. No matter what you've been going through, sir, ma'am, no matter what, his grace is made away. I'm going to tell you, there'll never be a moment like this one right now. You need to grab the moment. Seize the moment. Seize it. Walk in. Don't, 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 don't let the past and don't worry about what you're leaving behind. Just walk on in. If you're walking in this room today, you're saying, Bishop Colette, I need to walk forward in my life. I need to, I, I'm not going to look back anymore because I recognize objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. So I'm not going to look in the mirror. I'm not going to be like the children of Israel who looked back. And they'll find every opportunity to return to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. So, Lord, today, if that's you, just raise your hand and say, I'm going forward. I'm never turning back. And today is the first day of the rest of my life. And if you pray that prayer and you say you're, you're praying that prayer, accepting Christ, I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you as well. And I believe that God is shifting things in our world right now because the kingdom of God suffers violence but the violence sees it and they got to move so we're moving we're moving we're moving we're moving we're God's army in the name of Jesus can you shout amen 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 you can be seated as we close today did you get anything out of that